John chapter 4, verse 21, and I'm going to read through verse 24. I'm going to read out the New Living Translation. If I can invite you to your feet, that would be great. Um, I'll, I'll share a lot of King James as well in this. Praise God. John chapter 4, verse 21. Scripture reads, it says, And Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter where you worship the Father, on this mountain or in Jerusalem, because they, they were in conflict of where worship should take place. They were in conflict, right? And Jesus is saying, it, it's not so much about the place. You should worship as much at home as you do at church. Because the same God that visits us here will visit you there. He said, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. So he's, he's drawn, drawn the line, if you will. When true worshipers, interesting, because that means there can be fake worshipers. They can be people who sing songs but don't know who they're singing to. Okay. But, but, but the true worshipers, here you go, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is looking. There's not a, pa a lot of passages in Scripture where it identifies what God is looking for. Uh, two come to mind. God's looking for somebody to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge. And God's looking for a true worshiper. God's looking for a worshiper. For a worshiper. God is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is a spirit. We talked about that last week. So those who worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Father, thank you for giving us weapons to deal with what is spiritually in turmoil and conflict. God, weaponize the instruments of this place today and release their sound in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, as you're getting your seat, tell somebody, say, worship is warfare. Worship is warfare. And let me, let me just, before I jump in, I see Brad and Rebecca Parks here. Man, we love you guys so much. The Lord has sent them to Missouri of all places. For real. And they're planting a church, and we're grateful to have church planters among us. Engage church, is that correct? We're excited, man. Hopefully, we as Mosaic are going to get to really partner well with them, right? They're, they're a product. They was here many years serving with us, so we're excited to have you in the house today. Thank God for both of you. Last week, I really tried to put some information out. And I took a lot of time to talk to you about the realm of the Spirit and describe for you spiritual beings. First and foremost, describe to you that God is a spirit. He doesn't have a form. He, he doesn't have a, a body. The, the formed body of God is Jesus. It, that Jesus is what God looks like in body. But God is a spirit. And his spirit is omnipotent. It's all powerful. It's omnipresent. It's everywhere at the same time. He's the only one. And he's omniscient. He knows everything, even your thoughts are far off. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow, and he knows what's going to happen a million years from today. He knows everything. Let, let me clarify. The devil is none of those. The devil is not omniscient. He can't read your mind at all. But he can sow thoughts in the spirit and tell by your actions whether they've taken hold or not. Hello? So he, he, he's been around a minute. He knows humanity. But he can't read your mind. He can sow thoughts in the spirit that you can pick up and you can manifest through agreement in your physical body. Amen? He, 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 he's not omnipotent. He's not all power. But let me just... To tell you this as bad as I hate to say it, he does have some. Read the book of Revelations, how he gives power through spiritual impartation to this Antichrist. 
who the Bible says does lying signs and wonders, who will deceive the very elect, meaning that he's going to perform a miracle and you'll call it God, but it'll have demonic origins. Yeah. And, 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 and when the hedge of God is not built around people, let me, let me sober you a little more with this. He can assault your life, Job, through relationship. He sent the Chaldeans to come plunder and steal. The fact that theft took place lets me know the origin of the influencer. Because the thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy. When I see those manifestations taking place, I know who it is. I know what influence they're under. I know what spirit they've gotten into agreement with. When I hear slander and accusation, hence we'll call it gossip, I know what spirit it is. Because the Bible describes Satan as a, 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 a slanderer, or if you need a King James, an accuser of the brethren. And so he makes accusations, and when the accusations start flying towards believers of Jesus, I know the influence. Why is that important? Because the Bible doesn't want us to be ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. Why? Because when they manifest, I know now who I'm dealing with because if I'm not careful, I'll think it's flesh and blood, but I'm not fighting flesh and blood. But spiritual wickedness is my opponent. Don't fear man who could only kill the body. That's not... Okay, okay. I know this sounds like some kind of Marvel comic stuff. And we've been Hollywood so much that it's desensitized us to the believability of what is actualities in the spirit. I, I, I'm, I'm going to. God has given you and I, I need you to get this, the earth. God has given you and I the earth. Psalms 115 verse 16 says, The heavens belong to the Lord, but he has given the earth to all humanity. Now, he's God nonetheless, but he doesn't work in the earth. Here you go. Never without man, without woman. He didn't even save you because he could simply do it in his power. He became a man because in order to redeem, he had to become the authority in mankind again. Are, are, you, are you tracking with what I'm saying? So if he couldn't save you until he became a man, the man Christ Jesus and died on a cross then other people aren't going to be saved until people who are convinced that God became a man and received the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, let it now quicken your mortal body so that you, like Jesus, can walk through this earth and be the agents of salvation. Romans chapter 10, how shall they hear and how shall they be saved unless they preach a proclaimer of the truth of God in Christ that gets in front of them and speaks into their ear where faith cometh by hearing and something awakens within humanity because all mankind has been given a measure of faith to believe. It just takes truth to unlock the measure of faith that is this is like Christianity 101, I understand, and forgive me for being so elementary, but I need you to understand, you are the authority. You have been given dominion, authority, and God wants you to use that to let heaven's will, let thy kingdom come, 
and that thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When you pray, you should be saying, God, let me get so connected in the spirit that I can manifest in the natural what is being legislated in the spirit. I've, I got some Holy Ghost goosebumps going on now. You know, watch out, I'm going to act Pentecostal right on you. I've been hanging out with a bunch of men this week on fire for Jesus. Now listen, let, let, let me clarify a point. Jesus, when he died, he took authority from the devil in this paradigm. He took the keys of death and hell away from Satan. But he did not, here you go, he did not dethrone him as the principality that is ruling in heavenly places. He took the keys of death and hell. And by the way, death and hell are spirit beings. They're spirit beings. They're, here, here let, me, let me, they're angels. Jesus says, I saw someone riding on a pale horse. And his name was death. And hell was following him. That's why you get all the way to the end of the revelations and it said, and death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says he, before he ascended, descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Because prior to his resurrection, when men died, death and hell took a hold of their spirits. That's why in the book of Jude, the Bible says that the, the, the Satan is contending with Michael, the archangel, over the body of Moses because he had legal right. This messes that doctrine you've been taught all your life up, doesn't it? That's why the Bible says when Jesus came out of the grave, many graves were open. When he resurrected, he wasn't the only one. A lot of graves opened up because there's a story of the rich man and Lazarus and those who had died in faith needed the same saving grace that you and I need prior to Jesus and they were held in a place we'll call Abraham's bosom and so they didn't go to Sheol or hell or Hades where the rich man can see up he can see he was conscious he, he was aware and he sees he sees Lazarus in the bosom and he says he says hey let him dip his finger in water and come and quench this thirst because this is a tormenting place it's not the final destination. But when Jesus died on the cross, he ascended into the lower parts of the earth. That's what your Bible teaches you, Ephesians. And he took captivity captive. He got them. And so death and hell have lost their hold. That's why you and I live free. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we don't have to live in fear of what shall come. We know because he lives, I'm going to live too. And in order to get there, unless you get raptured, it's appointed unto man once to die. Jesus took control and hell lost its hold. But the fight, here you go, rages on. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This is the Apostle Paul, long after the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, excuse me. I don't need help. Excuse me. Maybe I do. Here's Peter saying to the believers... Hey, listen, the devil wants you. He wants to destroy you. He's walking about making a lot of noise, wanting to devour people's lives because that's an attribute of who he is. Are you, and then he says this, whom you should resist steadfast in the faith. Meaning this, that you're not going to get out of the conflict 
But you need to find a way through your faith to leverage your faith in order to prove resistance. Because if you resist the devil, he will flee. Even though he has governance through people that fall prey to his influence, even though Paul calls him in Ephesians the God of this world, your faith is your victory. You overcome it through your faith. Faith is not simply believing, it's also expressive. James said, he said, show me your faith by your works. Because what you believe should play out in how you live. What you are convinced of should show out in what you give your life to. Are, are, you, are you with me? And so we have an enemy. And he is coming at you. And you're not going to get the opportunity to avoid him. And he doesn't always come with horns, a pitchfork, a long red tail. Sometimes he's tall, dark, and handsome with a good job and six-pack abs. Sometimes she's a brunette with blue eyes. Can't have green. With, with blue eyes in a miniskirt sitting in the cubicle right next to you. Do you want me to patronize you or you want me to weaponize you? You, you need to figure out which, which, which one. I'm not in the patronizing mood. No, we're, we're, we're in the fight. We don't get to avoid it. But he's given us weapons. Because you need, here you go, spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You have spiritual weaponry that is mighty, megas in God. And it has power to pull down strongholds. What is a stronghold? Strongholds are mindsets and mentalities and lifestyles and addictions that are consequential of that. And you and I have weaponry to pull down the strongholds of the devil in which he is using to hold humanity captive. It's a shame I already took up offering. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you about one of these weapons. Worship is a weapon. Worship is a weapon. Worship can be a warship. It is an agent of battle. It is armament in the realm of the spirit. Worship. No, let, me, let me say this. Here, here you go. Worship is sound and it is song. Worship is sound and it is song. It, can be, it, can, it, it, it uses instruments and it uses voices that express their gratitude to God for all his glory. When you sing, you are fighting and you don't even know it. Most of the time we come into this place and sing our songs and do not know that we're contending in conflict with songs. It's just not singing the latest, greatest of, of, of Elevation and, and Maverick City and, and Bethel and whomsoever. That, we're just not singing songs. No, we're entering his courts and gates with thanksgiving and praise because we're posturing ourselves to create something where the Spirit of God for the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Something attractive goes on in the Spirit when people begin to sing the songs of the Lord. The Bible said that God enthrones himself in the place where his name is being lifted up. Oh, when you just start singing to the Lord a new song or an old song, it catches heaven's ear and it brings the presence of God near. Worship is a weapon. And listen, worship has an origin long before humanity. In the realm of the spirit, worship has been taking place for thousands of years. 
There, amen. Notice this in Job 38, 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. It's not talking about you and I as sons. This is predating. Long before God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed his spirit in him, there was worship taking place. Singing songs is a part of the spirit realm. It belongs in the realm of the spirit. It originated in the realm of the spirit. When Gabriel announces the birth of Jesus, you keep in the storyline, all of a sudden at his birth time, the angels are singing their song. Fast forward to the book of Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and the Bible says they're falling down and throwing their crowns before the one who is worthy to break the seal and they're singing their songs in heaven. Now listen, if you, if you have worship, then you need a worship leader. Somebody that is directing the praise. And heaven had a worship leader long before Matthew Ammons. <laughs> Lucifer was the worship leader. He led worship. He was the, the, the chair that covers. Let, let, me, let me help you. I got to give you a scripture for that one, don't I? Ezekiel 38, verse 13. It says, notice this, you have been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, we know that to be the truth. Because that old serpent, that old serpent, the devil, is what Jesus describes him, or the angel does. Notice this, every precious stone was thy carvery. Carving, uh, covering, excuse me, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. Notice this. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that you was created. I told you last week that Lucifer was a created angel. His name means son of the morning. He, he was the praise and worship leader. And when you get into this text, I encourage you to read it deeply. When you get into this text, it says that it, he was created, here you go, as a worship instrument. Yeah. It, the workmanship of his vesture, if you will, was pipes and stones. Stones always represent an act or an expression of worship in Scripture. Yeah. In, in the Old Testament, you would see them erect stone altars to commemorate God, to worship God upon Stone altar. Jesus said, if you don't worship me, the stones are going to cry out. The high priest, when he would go in before the Lord, he had stones set in his ephod because he's entering his gates and courts with thanksgiving and praise. Praise always goes first. That's why we start our service with praise because in the Old Testament, Judah, which means to be praised, was always the one that was sent ahead of everyone else. It starts with praise. If you don't have a praise, you don't have an answer to prayer. Because the altar of incense, are you hearing me, was before the throne of God. It was the place that you praised your way to so you could grab a hold of and make your request known unto the God that you worship yourself from the gate to the place. Oh, help me, God. I'm, here, here, here you go. He, he said, the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in the day you were created. Thou art, here's what he calls him, the anointed cherub that covers. I have set thee so. You was upon the mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in the day in which you were created. And then it says this, until iniquity was found in you. He's a cherub. When you study out what a cherub is as an angelic being, it is this winged creature whose responsibility is, is to be in proximity of the presence of God. Right? That's why before the Holy of Holies on the temple, it had cherubs on the veil that was rent. And when you got into the holy place, the Bible says, the most holy place, the Bible says that on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was two cherubs that were cast whose wings stretched out over the Ark of the Covenant of God. And it was in the midst of the cherubs where the presence of God would dwell because God dwells where worship is made. 
Oh, man. Come on. Somebody going to get a song today. Somebody going to get set free today. Are, are, are you tracking with me? Yes, now, the fact that he is a winged creature and God is a spirit, ruach, wind, and breath, right? So when he who has proximity to the Spirit of God moved in the presence of God, it was the Spirit of God, wind of God, that blowed through his vesture that caused a sound to come out of his being that heaven responded to with song and shouts of praise. And so when the cherub moved in the presence of God, the wind of God, his spirit moved through his creative being and his part, his, his, his wind instrument gave off a sound that caused heaven to respond. The problem is, with, with music today is when we clap and shout, the worship leader thinks we're clapping and shouting for them. And pride lifted him up. And Satan, here you go, wants your worship. Because he used to think that the adoration was because of the beauty and the craftsmanship of his created being. And so when heaven responded, he got intoxicated. That's why worship is one of the most fault places in ministry. Created people. Hey. He was a worship being, and he merchandised his calling. Pride lifted up. Hey, I'll give you just this quick tidbit. He, here you go, defiled the sanctuary of heaven. That's why, this is interesting, that's why when Jesus was seen after the resurrection, he told Mary, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. The writer of Hebrews says that he made atonement for the heavenly tabernacle that Moses got a picture of and says, build it according to the pattern in earth that you've seen in the spirit because this is the pattern that it's going to take for God to dwell in. That's why Jesus is so powerful for you and I to know because that's where the spirit of God is going to dwell. To another he gave. Another means of like type and character and being. And the Holy Spirit is looking for somebody that looks like Jesus. Oh, help me, God. No, 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 worship is the place that we fight. This is the place where we take over. It, it, here you go. It shatters atmospheres. It shatters atmospheres that are heavy, that are toxic. Worship shatters atmosphere. Notice this, 1 Samuel 16, 23. said, it came to pass when the evil spirits from God was upon Saul. That's interesting, isn't it? Maybe we ought to go through the whole book of Job. I don't know that we've ever done that. When the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp, played in his hand, so Saul was refreshed as well. Here you go. This is key. And the evil spirit departed from him. A young kid, 16 years old, that has a heart for God, gets over in the corner when the king is sitting on his throne, being tormented by a spirit, and he starts to play. And when he starts to play, the atmosphere has to shift. The moment that the heart of the worshiper started opening up, the atmosphere got shattered, and there was no place for the enemy to dwell. Why? Because God inhabits, takes up residence in thrones in the place where praise is being made. You want to change what it feels like at home? Shut the TV off. Get the kids out of the bedroom. Turn on some music. You'll shift. The, you'll shatter the atmosphere. Are you fighting every evening? Well, put some praise and worship music on before he comes in. And when he's complaining and grabbing, he's like, what? I can't hear you. You ain't. Take control. Worship is a weapon that'll send the devil running. Because he wants your worship. And you know how he gets it? Is when you don't give it to God. I'm not throwing stones, but there's a lot of you in here can't wait for the song service to get over. You don't understand. 
Oh, it got quiet, didn't it? It got, it got quiet. I, I, listen, I understand, especially when it's not my genre, especially when it's not sung by the person I want to sing it. I, I, I get that we have preference, but they're not up here to minister your preference. They're up here to give you language. So you can say something to God and about God that you might not have said all week long. You should show up early for worship because it's your and my opportunity every week to get in the light and say, God, you're good and your mercy endures forever. Oh, let me sing my song unto the Lord, for he has done marvelous things. If you don't sing, you ain't recognizing what's being done on your behalf. It shatters atmospheres. I was in India, and, uh, and I got a lot of zeal. I, got, I had a lot of zeal. And so I'm going like... I'm, I'm going to take down Dagon's temple, right? I'm carrying the Ark of the Covenant into the temples, and Dagon's going to fall and be crashed over the threshold because there's idol worship everywhere. And we're in a remote area. And so I've got a lot of zeal, but not a lot of wisdom. And so I'm wanting to, to, to go out into these neighborhoods, and the people that was hosting us was like, no, that's not a good idea. It was a very hostile area. People slept at our doors at night. They, they were very protective. But I'm like, hey, I'm God's man. Come on. Yeah. You don't know who I am. I'm just not another white guy from the States. <laughs> so reluctantly, they said, okay, let's just walk down the street and we'll walk with you. Oh, I'm fired up. Um, we're walking, we're witnessing, we're praying for people and people who are, are, are Hindus and, you know, they got the, the, the red dot on the floor. We're praying in the streets, we're laying hands on them and God is just moving. And all of a sudden I walk up into this place and this guy is kind of down in a low area and all he's got, he's got a loincloth on. Let me just help you. If you run into somebody that's only wearing a loincloth, be careful. I don't care. I'm like, and, 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 and my, guy, my guy says, I said, what's he saying? Because he was, he was speaking in Hindi, and, 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 he's, and he said, he's wanting us to come down there if we're not afraid. I thought, let's go. Yeah. So I'm formulating my, my gospel narrative as I'm walking down the hill. I'm going to let him say what he's wanting to say, then I'm going to give him Jesus. I mean, I'm going to hit him with Jesus, right? And I've got this salvation persuasive message already built. Well, when I sit down, he sits down, and he starts gyrating. I mean, just starts twitching like, I'm like, oh. Before I could open my mouth, he started talking about my kids. Like, seriously, my, my son hadn't been in college long at all at that time, and he started out in an engineering track. He said that. He said, your son wants to be an engineer, doesn't he? I'm like, oh. <laughs> when, when my Holy Spirit really gets to moving, I mean, my, my right arm will like get. Like, that's, I don't know, it's weird. But, I, you know, it's just the way it is with me. When, it re, when I'm really feeling it, my arm will get to just like shaking like that. I'll, I'll get to like, like, if you see my hand shaking, I'm about to bust the devil in the face and hit his mother-in-law too. I mean, I'm going to hit him so hard it, it takes his mother-in-law out. But when he started that, my arm started hurting bad. I mean, I felt it. I freaked out. Listen, let me preface this so you don't think I'm that weak. I have, whether you believe this or not, we have cast out devils. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a young 12-year-old girl across the floor foaming and spitting blood. People scratching their faces and slithering like snakes on the ground and would find after contending with that them clothed and in their right mind. I got story after story to tell you. So when it comes to like casting out spirits, I'm your guy. I'm not afraid. I'm not fighting you either. I'm, I'll just lay down beside you and start praying. I, it just doesn't, but not that day. Not that I, I freaked. All of a sudden, I stood straight up and I said, We got to get out of here. I mean, I was like one of the seven sons of Sceva that Paul talked about <laughs> that got beat up so bad by the devil and sent naked running down the road. You can read that in the book of Acts. It really happened. And, and, and so 
I am like, I've got to preach. I've got crusades, outdoor crusades. And I am just like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm freaked out. And I come up and there was this small old Catholic church in the distance. And I ran for it. Ran for it. I opened that door to that old Catholic church and I kicked my shoes off. And for the next two hours... I had my hands in the air, and I worshiped with everything in me. It took a moment of worship that lasted two hours for that thing to break. I'm, I, I sung the song of the Lord as loud as I could. Finally, the nun got tired of it, and she ran me off. But I, I, and, 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 I got, and I got a breakthrough. It wasn't that I didn't know how to quote scripture, because I knew how to quote scripture, but I was facing something in the spirit that I wasn't prepared for, because some things only go but by prayer and fasting, and there's rank in the spirit, and some things that you can whip pretty easy, if you're not careful, you'll run upon something that's not so easy to whip. Oh, my Jesus. I, I shifted that atmosphere that day. Some, something but worship shatters an atmosphere and I found the peace that I needed and the courage to get up that night and 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 and, and declare the word of the Lord and see hundreds of people being touched by the Spirit of God it, it was amazing uh, listen I will tell you this I went back the next year and I want to let you know I fasted a whole lot before that trip I was like I will not be running off looking back I was thinking why didn't I grab him by the head why didn't I grab him by the head but fear grabbed a hold of me, that tormenting spirit, and I needed a song to give me a breakthrough. Singing songs will give you the breakthrough that you need. It will unshackle you in the midst of your challenges and, and, and discourage it. The Bible says in the book of Acts that, that Paul and them had been beaten with rods, stripped naked and chained in the innermost recesses of the prison house. And the Bible says at midnight, which is an indication, it's the darkest that it can be. It's the worst that it can be. And at midnight, they found a song. And the Bible said they started singing in the midst of the prison cell. They started praising God in spite of their circumstances. They started giving glory to him who was worthy no matter what was happening to them in life. And the Bible said that all of a sudden there was a shaking and a loosening and the jail doors flung open and the chains supernaturally fell off of them. Why? Because they praised the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Here you go, here you go. When Satan fell, God needed a new worship leader. God needed a new worship leader, so he made one. He designed one with the instrument already built in. Oh. No, no, he designed one. You know who the new worship leader is? It's not one angel. It's all humanity that has a built-in instrument. That's why the Bible says, clap your hands. Oh, you people. That's why the Bible says shout unto God with the voice of triumph. That's why the Bible says dance with all your might. Woo! For those that worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. And an angel in the presence of God would feel the Spirit of God coming through his being and a sound would come out. Can I tell you, the same Spirit is blowing today and it's wanting to blow through your, through your instrument. What will you do? Here you go. You got vocal chords. Oh, you're an instrument. And you know what it takes to move your vocal cords? It takes wind. 
it takes wind. And when the wind passes through, a sound comes out. I come to tell you, God is loosening worship, warfare out of the mouths of his people in this season.